And Peter, you mentioned DEXA there a little bit ago, and anyone who's listening to this podcast will be familiar with the DEXA scan because we talk about it a lot and looking at, you know, fat and like the benefits that you can get from that. Is that the best way for listeners to figure out what their BMD is? Is that how you're doing it in patients? Yes. Um, so DEXA is a super, super low radiation scan, nothing like a CT scan. Um, it, you know, takes 10 minutes, you lay on a table, a little scanner moves over your body and it's using two very low dose x-rays that are absorbed differentially by bones and soft tissues. And so it's able to differentiate between adipose tissue, bone and lean tissue or non adipose tissue. Um, I will say this, not all DEXA scanners are created equal. So if you want to know your bone health, make sure before you go and get the DEXA scan, you confirm with the entity doing this, that they are giving you segmental bone analysis for left hip, right hip, lumbar spine. A lot of DEXA places can only give you whole body BMD. So they'll just spit out the Z score for that one, uh, for that one metric, but they won't give it to you segmentally. So, um, and that's sometimes okay. Like if a person's BMD is very high, you don't need the segmental analysis. But if you're doing this to screen for BMD, uh, you have to make sure, of course, that the that the DEXA is capable of doing that. Yeah. And just a reminder for people, um, we talked about this in another episode, but uh, we were always surprised at how easy it is to get a DEXA scan, right? You don't need a doctor to do it. So if you just Google the city you're in and then DEXA, you should be able to find different providers that do it for relatively cheap. I think in most cities, it's around $100, $150. So it has a lot of benefits. And just maybe remind people again, if they are calling different places, what are the three things they want to look for? Yeah, you want to make sure when you're doing a DEXA, again, if you care about knowing the full BMD, and you're going to pay more for that segmental analysis. So when you talk about those scans that are like in the 100 125, even up to 150, a lot of times they aren't showing everything. They're just giving you body composition um, and usually visceral fat now. Um, you'll say up to $400 typically if you want to see everything. But again, it's all like, I mean, you're going to pay more in New York and San Francisco than you're going to pay in Austin, Texas, for example. Um, I, I probably pay like 125 for mine, but I'm not getting the full uh, BMD analysis because I've already had it done and my BMD is high. So I don't need to screen that frequently, uh, not at the rate that I screen everything. The other things you want to look at, you obviously want to make sure you're getting full segmental lean tissue analysis. So you can look at appendicular lean mass index that you can calculate for yourself. Obviously fat-free mass index, you can calculate for yourself. Fat mass index, you can calculate, you need them to be able to give you that. Um, and so those are, those are kind of the things I want to see along with BMD. And let's say you have like you and a friend are going and getting your BMD done through a DEXA scan. Is there going to be variability that exists in bone density between different people? Like let's say even if someone didn't have osteopenia or osteoporosis, can there just be natural variability between different types of people? Yeah. And, and it's also important to understand the number you're going to get. So they don't, at least to my knowledge, I don't recall seeing them typically report in grams per centimeter cubed your BMD. Because what would you do with that information? Like, it's not that helpful. What you really need to know is statistically, where do you rank? And this is done via a T score and a Z score. And this is done to compare you to a young, healthy adult and to an adult that is your age. So if you go back to statistics 101, I think many people may recall the idea of a normal distribution, which is a bell curve function. And a Z score is basically telling you where you lie on that distribution. So a Z score of zero means you are right in the middle of the distribution. And if you're in the middle of that distribution, it means you are you have a higher bone mineral density than 50% of people and a lower bone density than 50% of people. If your Z score is plus one, it means you are one standard deviation above the mean, which means 
you are you have a higher bone density than 82.5% of the population and a lower bone density than 17.5% of the population. If your Z-score is plus 0.2, it means you are two standard deviations above the mean, which means you're at 97.5% percent you're you're higher than 97.5 percent of the population of course this works in reverse a z-score of minus two means you have a lower bone density than 97.5 percent of the population so that's what z-scores do they're i'm sorry I, I may have misspoke the z-score is comparing you to your age when i say the population the t-score is comparing you to the young healthy individual so in other words for someone who's older, the Z-score is always going to be more favorable than the T-score. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, because you're comparing to a 30 year If you're 60, you want to compare yourself to not only a 30-year-old, but also other 60-year-olds. That's correct. And is it, when you look at for yourself and even with your patients, their scores, is it kind of like how you do VO2 max where you always want to be in the elite of the elite categories for like you know vo2 max you want to be elite and a decade younger for like bmd do you if someone is at that zero that 50th percentile does that worry you or is it a little different in how you look at this other things factor into this nick i mean family history factors into it history of smoking factors into this current lifestyle i hate the word lifestyle but i think you know what i mean you know sort of how active is that person how much weight bearing activity are they doing? So uh, being male versus female also factors into it a lot. So if I see a woman prior to menopause, so let's say I'm talking about, you know, I got a 42 year old female patient who's, you know, I might guess three to five years out from menopause and she already has a low Z score. That worries me a lot because of what we'll talk about shortly vis-a-vis uh, -vis the effect of estrogen here and why women are disproportionately affected by estrogen estrogen withdrawal. But, you know, you've heard me make this, my glib, stupid joke, right? Never in the history of civilization has a 90-year-old person ever been heard uttering, I wish I was less strong. I wish I had less muscle. I wish my bone density wasn't so high right impossible yeah you know how tim ferris always asks people on the podcast you know what uh <laughs> what would they put on a billboard yeah i think we've we've come to the conclusion of what you would 100 percent put on your billboard that's right the peter atia billboard would just say find me one example in the history of our species where a 90 year old said i wish i had less strength i wish i had less muscle i wish i had weaker bones love it love it all right, Nick, so pull up figure five. All right, got figure five pulled up. Okay, so you can see on this graph, we're looking at uh, males versus females, top to bottom. And then we're looking at Mexican-American, non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black. So three races, two sexes, uh, six lines. Um, but I just want to make one thing <clears throat> to the listener a little bit clear, which is on the y-axis here, you're seeing units of grams per centimeter squared. Earlier I said grams per centimeter cubed. Why the difference? Well, the difference is even though density <clears throat> in real life is measured in grams per centimeter cubed because you need mass per unit volume, with bone density, it's actually done as grams per centimeter squared because it's a planar measurement. So the DEXA scan is compressing everything to 2D. Does that make sense? Because the scanner is kind of looking at the area of the bone and imputing the density by what electron beam doesn't go through it. So I've always found this a bit confusing personally, and I've always thought, I've always wondered why they just can't do this in grams per centimeter cube, but I, I'll just point that out for, for the astute observer. Okay, I think there are two observations that one would pretty quickly take away from this. The first is that up until, you know, the 20s, men and women are kind of similar, right? You go through a profound increase in BMD from the time you're eight years old until you're about 20 years old. Difference one is that uh, while women maintain a reasonable plateau, they tend to fall quite precipitously in midlife. 
And that's obviously due to menopause. We'll talk about why in a moment. I think the second thing that jumps out here is the racial difference. So non-Hispanic black has a higher BMD for both men and women than non-Hispanic white, which has a higher BMD than Mexican or Hispanic, in this case, Mexican-American. So again, slight differences in race. Truthfully, I don't know why that is, um, but it is what it is. So uh, to your earlier question, are there differences? Yeah, there are differences on average. Um, I've never, to be honest with you, factored this into my risk ex assessment, except for the male-female one. Um, so in other words, if I look at a patient who's black versus white versus, his, his, versus Hispanic, I kind of have never assumed one is at more or less risk. I've just said, let's do the kitchen sink on everybody. Uh, but I think in females, I'm more worried for the reasons that we are obviously talking about. Yeah. And in looking at this too, and one of the questions we received is, you know, when, when should people do their first bone mineral density scan? You know, when do you want to know that baseline? Because what's interesting when you look at this and you talked about it is, you know, from eight to about 20, 22, you see that huge jump and then it kind of levels off. So what would your recommendation be for when people should get their first one done? Going to get into a lot of hot water here, Nick. So, but I'm, I'm used to it, right? I've got very um, unusual recommendations for a lot of things, and this is no different. So I think in the spirit of fairness, I'm going to communicate the standard recommendations first. So when you look at the American Association of Family Physicians, the American College of obstetricians and gynecologists, the American College of Preventative Medicine, the International Society of Clinical Densiometry, the National Osteoporosis Foundation, and more. The typical recommendation um, is for high-risk people to be 50, um, but typically 65 is sort of when they want to start screening people. Um, and that's for women. And for men, it's typically 70. It's a lot of credentials you just laid out there. Are you sure you want to get in hot water with all of those different people? No, I, I, I'm just simply stating what they're recommending. And if I've misrepresented that, uh, feel free to correct us. But, um, you know, it's typically recommended, as I said, women at 65, men at 70, follow-up scans no more than every two years. Um, now, for someone who is at serious risk of osteoporosis, which includes men and women over the age of 50, um, you know, they can, we can adjust those and, and come down a little bit. Um, now the WHO I think is a little bit more aggressive and recommends screening women by the age of 40, if I'm not mistaken. Um, as you can guess, I tend to be closer, uh, in my thinking, uh, to the WHO. And I certainly believe women in their 30s where we're doing DEXA scans for many reasons. I'm just as interested in their bone mineral density. In fact, when I'm reporting the DEXA results to patients, we have a template that we've made that I really like that lays all of the DEXA information out, right? So segmental BMD, you know, VAT, um, FFMI, ALMI, FMI, all of these things, body fat for what it's worth. I always tell them out of the gate, like, the one number you care about is your body fat. That's the one I care least about. Um, and yeah, so when we, you know, when we're looking at a 35 year old patient and their Z score is already minus one, I mean, that's just as concerning to me as if their OGTT shows, you know, very elevated postprandial glucose and insulin levels. Um, and I'm really happy that I'm seeing that at the age of 35 and not 65. I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights, You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways 
from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes, and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future.